All right, let's say a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord God Almighty, we celebrate with the Church in these days uh, martyrs like St. Sixtus and St. Lawrence, and we rejoice in their beautiful, deep faith, uh, as well as their tremendous courage and their willingness to live that faith in the midst of persecution. And we pray that you would increase our faith. Uh, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Strengthen my faith, encourage my faith, help me to have the faith of the martyrs. And we ask this prayer humbly through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So an elderly man uh, was dying in his bed the very, very, very end of his days and in a lot of agony. But suddenly he smells the aroma of his favorite chocolate chip cookies wafting up the steps in the house. And so he gathers all of his strength together and he uh, leans on, on, the, on the, the wall of his room and he gets to the edge of the door and he gets out into the hallway and he starts going down the steps and he's grabbing onto both sides of the thing and he ambling his way, almost falls down the steps, gets down to the bottom of the steps, sits down for a couple minutes, takes a break gets himself up again and starts heading into the kitchen and he gets into the kitchen and there on, on the kitchen table are dozens and dozens of his favorite chocolate chip cookies. And he's, you know, he's just about ready to go and grab one and, and his wife says, stay out of those, those are for your funeral. <laughs> I'm sure you knew where that was headed, but that's all right. Uh, so, um, we're continuing in this series on the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola, and today we're addressing discernment of spirits. And the notion of discernment of spirits is, is a very central and key element to Ignatius's exercises. Um, I would say it's one of his stronger contributions to uh, the enormously rich spiritual treasures offered by the Catholic Church, quite frankly. Um, St. Ignatius experienced uh, tremendous grace and insight throughout his own conversion process, which took place mostly in a cave uh, in the town of Manresa. And he paid very, very close attention to the subtleties of God working in his heart and in his life, in his soul, throughout his conversion process. And actually, he spent most of his later years in Rome directing the Jesuit community, which he founded, but leading the spiritual exercises and actually uh, directing individual souls as a, as a spiritual director. Now, in summary, uh, the reality is, my brothers and sisters, that our minds are bombarded by plenty of thoughts. And many of them come, in a sense, from the outside. And in this day and age, with the internet, we are really bombarded by uh, all kinds of, of thoughts and uh, issues and topics and images and so forth. Um, uh, and secondly, um, we have a lot of thoughts that kind of bubble up from within, right? Our own thoughts. And uh, the question of the day is, how do we discern what is coming from God and what isn't? That's the bottom line. How do we learn as Christians to discern what is really coming from God and what isn't? Now, before I return to St. Ignatius, I, I want to offer a couple of maybe foundational words from Father Jack, as opposed to Ignatius. And that is that I say, that I think that there are a number of elements of the spiritual life that are very helpful for this process that are, that are on some level kind of foundational. One of them is daily prayer. Um, when we are really making an effort to get to know the Lord, to learn to slow down our minds and our hearts, to learn how to listen to God, 
it really is enormously helpful in this process of discernment of spirits. Um, I think that being firmly rooted in the gospel way of life, which seems more and more to be contradictory to our modern day culture, um, experiencing St. Paul's transformation of the mind, and gradually getting to that point where we can say that we're actually putting on the mind of Christ. Um, I would say growing in our desire to do God's will in our lives, because if we don't really have a desire to do God's will, we're not going to ask for it, we're not going to look for it. Do I desire God's will in my life, honestly? Um, spending time with good spiritual friends who are firmly on the road to Christ as well, because again, we, we, are, we are swimming against the tide in today's world, and we need to be doing it with others. And finally, um, I, I think that spiritual direction, uh, meeting regularly with uh, a spiritual mentor can be a huge help in figuring out God's will in our lives. So I just say that quickly, hopefully by, by way of introduction here. And so getting back to Ignatius, um, he offers a, a variety of very, very helpful hints as we are trying to uh, discern uh, what is coming to us that is of God and what isn't. The first of those are inordinate attachments, and I already addressed that in, an, in a previous reflection with you. Secondly, I would say uh, the discernment that Ignatius gives to us that's a little bit more geared towards the first week of the exercises. And so let me share a few of those things. Now, in, in, in a little bit more of Ignatius' own words, he would say, rules for understanding to some extent the different movements produced in the soul and for recognizing those that are good to admit them and those that are bad to reject them. That would be a little bit more of Ignatius's way of saying what it is that we're trying to do here. So for those who are still battling with serious sin in their lives, if, if we want to say um, going in a certain sense from one mortal sin to another, um, the enemy, Satan, is going to continue to propose pleasures, uh, sensual thoughts, uh, suggesting more gratification, uh, suggesting uh, to our imagination um, um, even more exciting things. That's the way in which the devil works when we're in the midst of uh, really wrestling with, with, with sin in our lives. And so he wants to kind of keep us wrapped up in those things, uh, keep us focused on those things. Um, and the good spirit is going to do the exact opposite. In this instance, um, the, the, the good spirit is, is actually going to challenge us to uh, say, hmm, this is clearly not of God and you've got to make some changes. And so uh, he will, um, with the use, use of reason, uh, kind of stir up and sting our conscience. Now, for those who are earnestly striving, maybe a little further along on that journey, earnestly striving to uh, cleanse their souls, to uh, to do the will of God, to fall more deeply in love with Him. It's the opposite in this instance, and He's going to harass you with anxiety. And He is going to afflict you with sadness. Oh, you're not really good enough to do this, and you can't really, you can't really live the Christian life. It's not really worth living to begin with. You're no good at it, obviously, you know. Um, versus the good spirit, which is going to strive to encourage you, give you courage, give you strength, consolation, tears, inspirations, and God forbid, peace as you are on this journey, knowing that, yes, I'm still failing and, I, and I'm still a sinner, but I'm on this road and I'm headed towards God. The good spirit helps the soul to move forward in doing good. Um, 
the next section here that I, I want to share with you is a little bit about spiritual consolation and desolation. This, I think, is, is another tremendous gift uh, of wisdom from St. Ignatius. So, spiritual consolation, and I, I'm going to use a little bit more of his language uh, again, just because I, I think it's, sometimes it's nice to hear the actual words of a saint. Uh, an interior movement is aroused in the soul by which it is inflamed with love of its creator. And as a consequence, can love no creature on the face of the earth for its own sake, but only in the creator of them all. So this is um, a moment in which we are growing deeply in our love for God. That's one way of describing it. Um, it is likewise consolation when one sheds tears that move to the love of God, whether it be because of sorrow for our sins. So we can have a moment where we come to a real insight into our sins and have a deep sorrow for our sins, are moved to tears, but this is flowing from love. And it leads to consolation. Uh, another cause of our consolation can be because of the sufferings of our Lord. Recently, just encouraged people in the midst of a homily. To, you know, when was the last time you actually pondered Jesus' pain? Whether it was on the cross or whether it was at the death of John the Baptist. Um, sometimes we can be so moved by Christ's sufferings for us that we can be moved to tears, and it's a time of consolation. Um, we can have another time of consolation for any reason that is immediately directed to the praise and, and service of God. Uh, finally, Ignatius says, I call consolation every increase of faith, hope, and love, and all interior joy that invites and attracts what is heavenly uh, and to the salvation of one's soul. So, I, I, I think that Hopefully, you know, it's fairly clear. These are moments, grace-filled moments, where we're experiencing, in a variety of ways, consolation that comes from God as we are making progress on our journey of faith. Um, generally, our relationship with God in those moments is strong. The light seems bright, right? There's plenty of encouragement. Uh, you feel maybe that God has his hand firmly on your shoulder. And during these times of consolation, it's good to think about those moments of desolation because, um, because they're going to come too, right? So moments of consolation then create the environment to discern and make good decisions. It is a great time to take a step forward in our journey of faith. So maybe the Lord's been putting something on our heart that I, I need to go to an extra mass during the week, or I need to go to confession more regularly, or I need to get a spiritual director, or I need to um, cut something out of my life. Moments of consolation are great moments to take a step forward in our faith. Um, they are also a time uh, to, uh, to rejoice because they don't last forever. So we need to be grateful and rejoice in those moments of consolation. We need to be careful, and this is, this is a great line, we need to be careful not to fall in love with the consolations of God rather than the God of consolation. It's a big issue. And this is part of the reason why I think that God doesn't give us consolation all the time is because then we get caught up in the consolation and not in God. <laughs> And then at the same time, oh, a warning, during moments of consolation, we have to be careful not to let our guard down because the devil is always looking at the castle to see where, where is the weak place to get into the castle. He's always looking. And so in moments of consolation, sometimes we can get proud. And then that opens up like the, the, the front door to the castle. Now, moments of spiritual desolation. Ignatius would say that, um, that this is darkness of the soul, a turmoil of spirit, 
an inclination to what is low and earthly, restlessness rising from many disturbances and temptations which lead us to a want of faith, a want of hope, and a want of love. Uh, another way in which he goes on to continue to describe desolation, the soul is slothful, and we know that slothfulness is really um, a, a kind of laziness, but a laziness that is really particularly connected to our relationship with God and our journey with God. The soul is slothful, tepid, sad, and separated as it were, as it were, from its Creator and Lord. The thoughts that spring from consolation are the opposite of those that spring from desolation. So, in times of desolation, we really should never make a change in our lives. As best possible. I mean, there's some times when we may have to make a change. But for the most part, it's a bad time to make big decisions. Because we're not seeing clearly. And we're not in a good moment, a good relationship with God. And so, um, for just as in consolation, the good spirit guides and counsels us, and it's clear. So, in the desolation, the evil spirit guides and counsels. Following his counsels, we can never find the way to the right decision. Now, when we're in a moment of desolation, God's grace is bigger than everything and anything. And so Ignatius will say, He can resist with the help of God, which always remains, though he may not clearly perceive it. So even in these moments, God is there. Even in these moments, God is doing His work. Even in these moments, God is giving us grace. Even in these moments, God is lifting us up. But the reality is that we're just not perceiving it in these moments of desolation. So he can resist with the help of God, which always remains, though he may not clearly perceive it. For, tho for though God has taken from him the abundance of fervor and overflowing love and the intensity of his favors, nevertheless he has sufficient grace for eternal salvation, as Ignatius would say it. So in these moments, we have to pray for the grace to persevere. So in moments of desolation, really sometimes we just have to say, I am staying here right now. I am not changing decisions that I made in moments of consolation. I'm not changing them. I want to. I feel like it. I'm not going to. I'm going to remain firm. We beg for the grace as a minimum to remain firm in moments of desolation. And then he says, as you can imagine, because there, there's this real kind of constant back and forth throughout this, let him consider, too, that consolation will return at some point. So in the moments of consolation, let's remember that desolation is going to be around the corner at some point. And in moments of desolation, let's remember this, too, will end. The principal reasons that Ignatius gives for desolation are three. Uh, the first is because we have been tepid and slothful and negligent in our exercises of our faith, in prayerfulness and going to Mass and getting to confession and hanging out with other good Christians. If we've been neglecting that, then it makes sense that we might be entering into a moment of desolation. A second reason is that God wishes to try us sometimes, to see how much uh, we really do believe in Him, how much we really do love Him, to deepen our faith, right? I mean, I think great coaches, uh, great teachers, they, they push us to our limits sometimes to get us to get to that next level. The third reason is because God wishes to give us true knowledge and understanding of ourselves so that we may have an intimate perception of the fact that it is not within our power to acquire and attain great devotion, intense love, tears, or any other spiritual consolation, but that all is the gift and grace of God our Lord. 
So it is sometimes God gives us desolation to remind us of this fundamental reality that all is gift. All is gift. And that we don't earn these things from God by our good works or even by our pious activities. Everything is gift. Now, I want to move on to a few more thoughts from Ignatius uh, that he gives to us, actually, for discernment during the second week of the exercises. And, um, and these are just some more helpful hints with the notion of discernment of spirits. So when we are trying to follow the call of the Lord in our life, we will find that the good spirit tends to give uh, support, encouragement, and oftentimes a certain delight in all of our endeavors. So we've kind of heard this already, but th this is a common theme, and we need, to, we need to be aware of this, that so often when we're on the road, the good spirit, and, you know, which is, comes to us from God, is going to be full of encouragement. And so he's thinking here very specifically with regard to kind of discern, discerning a big decision, maybe discerning our vocation, discerning our plan for this next year of our lives. When we're in a moment of discernment, uh, the good spirit is going to be full of encouragement. And again, the evil spirit will act to, to do the exact opposite, will subtly arouse dissatisfaction with our efforts, uh, will raise up doubts and anxieties about God's love and about how our response, um, and uh, maybe even sting the conscience with thoughts of pride in our attempt to live the good life. Oh, you're not doing so bad, but that's, it's because you're a pretty good guy and there's, there's no mention of God in there, right? This is the way in which the evil spirit works. A second point here is that uh, God sometimes chooses to give consolation to the soul without any preceding causes, without any events, without any moments, without any thoughts. Um, and he does these on occasion in order to just stir up a deeper love for him. And we really need to be grateful for those moments when they come. Um, common consolations from thoughts, uh, achievements, events, or people who have had an effect on us. Um, again, um, we know that the good spirit is involved when the consolation strengthens or quickens our progress on that path. Um, another way, I mean, again, with, with Ignatius, with the, certain subtleties, he says that the bad spirit arouses good feelings sometimes so that we can be drawn into uh, doing good things. And it's because he's the father of lies, he actually can send us consolations and get us moving down the road, but when in fact what he's going to do is steer us off the path real quickly. And um, quietly and slowly the change is brought about until the evil direction becomes clear. And so my brothers and sisters, I think that in part what Ignatius is saying here is that, that we have to be pretty attentive and pretty focused as we are striving to uh, figure out God's plan for us. Um, the evil spirit regularly appears like an angel of light. And, uh, and we need to be careful. Um, another point here, Ignatius encourages us to take note, uh, again, uh, of, of the, the course of our thoughts and actions. And so uh, he says something that, that's pretty obvious, but again, sometimes it's good to repeat these things. If the beginning, middle, and end of a decision, a thoughtfulness, an action uh, is all good and inclined to all good, it's a sign that it's coming from the good spirit, right? But if in the course of the thoughts, which he brings, it ends in something bad or a distracting tendency or is less good than what the soul had previously proposed it to, to do, or if it disquiets or weakens the soul, then it is not coming from God. 
And uh, this, is, uh, this is something that, that it takes time and uh, in prayer and experience and sometimes some guidance with a spiritual director to be able to see again how God is working in our lives. And so, my dear friends, um, th these are, are some, of, uh, some of the inspirations, some of the guidance, some of uh, the real treasure that I believe that uh, St. Ignatius offers to us as we are uh, working on uh, this, this goal of uh, rooting out uh, anything that keeps us from being completely attached to God and surrendering our hearts and our lives to Him in love and faith. And so, um, may God bless you and strengthen you uh, on your journey of faith, and hopefully some of these uh, guidelines and, and helpful hints uh, will be of assistance to you. So let's, let's finish with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. St. Ignatius of Loyola, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all very much.